All right, we have time for some questions, and I don't see, oh, there's the, uh, oh, I had to wake up the microphone operators. Uh, I think, who's got a question? Oh, we got all kinds of questions. Let's start uh, over here with the, one of our Canadians, right in front of you. <laughs> Hi, this is a question for you, Jim, because I'm also Canadian. Um, you were talking about the uh, third party advisory committees that you've initiated and started. Um, so I guess my, you know, just as a statement, my, my, I believe that the sort of drive within the industry in Canada is certainly, um, you know, the, towards transparency and recognizing the sort of need for social license comes from what happened with the Kinder Morgan application. I think that's led a lot of, you know, interest in this. So um, what I was wondering, you've brought in these advisory committees uh, to help you with SEPA, but are you encouraging your members to do the same thing with like third party audits, you know, for bring, again, bringing in, you know, Kinder Morgan, um, you know, we wondering if the, the the National Energy Board's said that they can go ahead, and if it does go ahead, they've got these recommendations. And one thing that was interesting to my group was, you know, the pre-construction and the environmental issues with the pre-construction. So we've asked uh, Trans Mountain, you know, would they be interested in having third party, you know, professional auditors there to see that they do this? Are you encouraging your group? Because I notice Trans Mountain's part of SEPA. So are you encouraging them to do that? Um, so I'm, I, I'll confess I'm not familiar with that particular instance in terms of what you're talking about, but I think that what I would, what I would refer you back to is you know, the comments that, uh, that, that Peter Watson made as the chair of the National Energy Board this morning too, in terms of saying you know, there, there were 100, and if I recall correctly, 157 conditions in the case of the Kinder Morgan uh, application and uh, and the NEB is absolutely charged with the responsibility to ensure that those conditions are met through the whole of the construction process and so they will have they should have I'm sure they will have inspectors uh, on the ground as that construction is unfolding and I'm also you know quite confident that should you know concerned citizens such as yourself have uh, you know bring to the attention of the board observations you know that that your you know your your belief or your experience is that it's not working in line with the conditions or the 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 code or the standards that are in place that they would they'd put an inspector on the ground in a heartbeat or two in order to make sure that that that's responded to um, the the third party that we're using is primarily around, <coughs> excuse me, the that whole integrity first program. I, I didn't you know go into a great detail around it, but uh, it's it's meant to ensure that uh, you know the assessments that the companies are conducting of themselves in a lot of these areas that we're developing through integrity first are are adequately verified and by no means is that seeking to replace the role of the regulator and that, that's just saying us like we want to demonstrate complete openness in terms of how this is working and the ultimate goal on that front too will be as it is done in responsible care to have citizens such as yourself actually participate in those verifications so that you can see firsthand that it it is credible it is real it's it's meant to be and and we believe it is so, you know, direct answer, I think ultimately there, you know, Mr. Watson is still here, so is uh, the Chief Safety Officer from the NEB. Easily, you know, folks you can, can raise those types of concerns to, and, uh, and I'll be pleased to, to remit your, your comments to the leadership of Kinder Morgan as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, my question is to Jim, and it's regarding uh, uh, shortly after our May 19th meeting in Calgary with yourselves, the NEB staff and members of the public, an announcement was made by the NEB regarding a joint committee uh, with SEPA. And I wonder if you could explain a little bit of what's happened in the meantime with that. Please do. Um, I mean, I. 
I think the the formation of that committee, and I know there there seemed to be a little bit of concern that it was almost coincident with with the forum. And I think it, what I would say was that it had it had been in the works to create that forum for some time. Uh, I have the privilege of co-chairing that committee with the chief operating officer of the National Energy Board. I think it speaks very directly to uh, to Mr. Watson's uh, desires to see. Um, like where there are challenges or issues that that really refer to the uh, like not the application but the life cycle operations of you know the, the companies uh, how do we put in place a, an opportunity to enhance the collaboration that, that can occur which in no way undermines or fetters the you know the the primacy of the regulator so it, it allows us to come together uh, you know, the sessions, at the, uh, there have been two meetings. Uh, there was a, an initial meeting, or the exact date escapes me, I want to say July roughly of 2016. Uh, it was chaired by, by Mr. Watson and by the chair, uh, the CEO of, of SEPA. Uh, they sort of set out the, you know, the, the marching orders for the committee, uh, set and, and approved the terms of reference and set out a working agenda for us. And so really it is intended to, to permit that form within which you know industry can collaborate on ongoing operational issues that uh, are completely apart from anything to do with ap an application which is fully subject to all the, the expectations of natural justice allows us to identify issues to bring you know the knowledge that's resident within the industry as well as you know tremendous knowledge within the the board itself to bear on these problems and to find ways to move forward uh, personal opinion uh, they could be in the meetings w could be enhanced, uh, you know, in terms of adding greater degrees of openness as well with citizens such as yourselves, because I think there, there's absolutely nothing to hide. I think you'd be encouraged if you ever saw the the kinds of conversations and the things that we're working on. So, uh, and that's really where it's at. And the next meeting is, uh, I think, I believe, just recently been scheduled for the 16th of December in order to close out the year and talk about some of the ongoing actions that we're working towards. Um, I've heard maybe a dozen times in the last two days that we all want the same thing, zero incidents. And, and I don't have any doubt that we all want zero incidents. Uh, but I, it's been some years since I've left, uh, been a lobbyist, but I have some, or a legislator, but I have some familiarity when you get into the, legislation or rulemaking, it doesn't seem like everybody wants the same thing. I mean, there are very, very intense uh, differences. Uh, and my question to you, it's both, a, I guess, a challenge and a question. I, 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 on the one hand, we all want the same thing. We know we aren't the ones, no one wants, you know, there's, we don't have any narcissistic sociopaths, um, except running for president maybe, but, um, but I mean, really, most, most normal people want the same thing. But then why is it, is it, I mean, you have other intervening needs, concerns, security, profits. I guess I'd, I'm asking you to respond to, and, and to dig in sincerely because we don't want the same things in the same context. And how do we get to zero? And we have to recognize what our differences are. Coalitions are great. Carls are rare. Uh, but it, it, it seems shallow. I guess we'll all take a shot at this. Um, we do all want the same thing. There's no question in my mind that we want the same thing. But I don't think we all see the same path to get there. And I think you make a great point. It, this is not easy. It's not easy striking a balance. I mean, let's face it, you know, if you wanted to build a perfectly safe distribution system, it would be, you know, fully welded stainless steel pipe that could never fail. But that would cost, it would be just, it would, it, it's, not, it's not possible. Plus, we have to understand that these systems have been built over more than 100 years. I mean, somebody asked me at, at dinner last night or, or at the cocktail party, you know, how old's your oldest piece of pipe? Well. My oldest piece of pipe was installed during the Civil War. 
right? And it's still functioning very well under the streets of Boston. So, so our systems have evolved over a long period of time and, and expectations of the public, the regulator, and the customers have changed over that period of time. So new regulations and new rules are a part of that, re that evolution and they need to be implemented in a way that we can do it and we can do it you know, economically and without too much disruption to the community and we can slowly, well, not slowly, we can incrementally improve everything that we do to get to the same place. But, it, but I, I really sincerely want the same thing that you do. Sincerely want the same thing that you do. A safe, reliable, clean, affordable energy delivery system for this country. But getting there takes time and it takes energy because the, the assets, some of the assets went in the ground a long time ago. They went in the ground before record keeping was very good. So we don't even know in some cases exactly what we have. We have to dig it up and look at it to, to fix it and repair it. So, so I think we want to get there. I think the regulators are doing an amazing job of writing the right kinds of regulation and legislation to help get us there. But it, it, takes, it takes time. The problem didn't happen overnight. It doesn't get solved overnight. So um, I don't know what more I can say, but that's my opinion. Um, <clears throat> and probably come at it from a similar viewpoint as sort of, and it's, you know, as Carl mentioned, you know, in, in Canada, we've been sort of working with this, uh, this abstract concept called social license. And, and, you know, who has it, who grants it, how do you understand really, really what it, what it means? And I think, you know, and again, I'll echo the comments, and I firmly believe and had the privilege to serve there that the, you know, boards and regulatory commi regulatory commissions uh, have incredibly complex roles to try and fulfill. I mean, who gets to decide the public interest at the national level? And, and at the national level, it could be very, very different than any individual community or certainly your backyard if, if you need to invoke eminent domain or the kinds of things that, that must be done, you know, from time to time in order to get, in order to succeed in constructing national infrastructure. Who decides which community is going to be flooded and, and never be seen again when you need to put a dam up? Who decides, you know, where the where the wires go when you build new power lines and, and pipelines and so on? And these these are these are complex decisions that have to be made uh, and at times, you know, individual interests uh, you know can't align with national interests. Um, but I can say that, you know, from my experience, having had the privilege to serve at both the board and now to represent these companies, that when it comes to safety, they're, they're completely aligned. Uh, you know, the cost of any incident now and the costs to, you know, reputational concerns on the part of any single company or especially at the indus industry level are astronomical in comparison to the cost of actually putting a safe system and maintaining a safe system in the ground. So from that viewpoint, I, I firmly believe that we're aligned in terms of wanting to provide a safe and you know, socially sustainable uh, energy system for our nations. Uh, you know, where, where the friction occurs now is saying, well, how do we, how do we balance that off with the interests of you know, in various communities? Are there direct economic benefits? How do they see that? How does that work? Very, very complex issues. And we can only get there by by working through them and having the quality of con <coughs> excuse me quality of conversation that occurs in forums such as this. Again, for which I thank Carl and PST for creating. Now I'm looking at it from the regulator standpoint, and that's a great question. I had some time to ponder it. Um, you know, obviously in a relatively safe industry, um, you know, when you we're looking at regulations, you have to pass. You make sure that they pass you know, the cost benefit analysis. So as a regulator, you know, I have to deal with, you know, as an inspector, as a regional director, I have to deal with what I got. And you have to start getting creative. You have to get creative in what you look at. Um, you know, we all know risk is probability times consequence. And sometimes like, sometimes I wonder if sometimes if we just focus too much on probability. And what I do is I actually try to focus on how do I drive down consequence, the river crossings, uh, uh, you know, uh, stuff that could go in, that could flow into a nearby reservoir or a nearby creek. So I've kind of tweaked, uh, you know, my approach to enforcing the regulations. That's number one, is looking at the consequence side. And number two is I look at change. I go straight to change. Uh, you know, I have this set of regulations and I focus on, you know, what's changed since I last been out there. But it's, uh, 
you know, the regulations give me a strategy, but I have to keep changing my tactics to become more efficient. So, uh, and yeah, I like tilting at windmills, I don't know. <laughs> All right, I'm going to answer, give a little bit of public, because I, I skipped over some slides yesterday that went after this directly. Because I, I've come to believe that when everybody says they want to get to zero, they're being totally truthful, too. I think the catch is, how quick do we want to get to zero? And quickness has to do with how much money we want to spend to get to zero. And we used to have meetings with one of the biggest gas companies around and uh, somebody that I really respect, one of the heads of one of those companies. And, you know, he was, he said, boy, we're spending billions of dollars to implement integrity management. And I said, but integrity management only applies to 7% of the pipelines in this country. What about the other 93%? Well, it's taken all of our effort to do 7% of the pipelines. And the public views these companies as being richer than God and they ought to be able to do more than one thing at a time, and the reality is that uh, th they can't for some of the reasons you just heard, and sometimes it's not even the companies that are in control. Sometimes there's rate regulators that won't let people replace pipelines because they're worried about someone's gas bill going up $2 a month. So there, there's all kinds of blame to go around, and some of it uh, falls on all of our shoulders, I think, but uh, you know, in our view, it's really, I think everybody wants to get to zero, but how quick do we want to get to zero, and I think that's where we probably vary on who's sitting up here. All right. Oh, we still have hands up. How about Mr. Jacoby here? Thank you, sir. Uh, one comment, that 7% is hypothetically the most sensitive 7% of the pipelines out there, so they are focusing their efforts where it will hypothetically do the most good. That's not to say that the other 93% doesn't need attention. Back to Sue's comment about taking three years to get, get inspection results, uh, Section 7 of the Pipes Act of 2016, recently enacted, uh, has a requirement that within 30 days of an inspection, PHMSA is supposed to conduct a post-inspection briefing with the owner of the operator and outline any concerns, and then they have to follow up uh, in, in 90 days. Um, Having said that, uh, I've been involved in a couple of inspections subsequent to that. And it's been more than 30 days, and I haven't heard anything. Uh, Chris, would you care to tell us how, how FEMS is planning on making that happen? All right. First of all, I don't think it just, I don't think it just applies to FEMSA. I think it also applies to the states that FEMSA uh, funds. So um, that's, uh, that's number one. Do they know that? Well, it just got passed a couple months oh, ago, okay. but yeah, I think they're all they're waking up. I breathe them, and naps are. It's got. It it's days. gonna be a land shift. Yeah. Um, the second thing is, um, you know, we we had a discussion. When does an inspection end? Is it when you pull off? Do you, is it when you leave the um, the operator? Is it when you get the last piece of information from the thing? I think that's something that needs to be decided. But it came apart. Three years is obviously too long. And the way I run it in my region is the operator should have no surprises. When we leave, he should have no surprises. He shouldn't be, especially if it's something of, of uh, impending risk. You know, it's, it's, they should know. So at least a verbal uh, or, you know, some type of exit briefing should be conducted always when you leave the site. Uh, but we do strive, we'll strive to get something out. I think the thing says 30 days for the facts and another 60 days for the for something in writing. So uh, yeah, we're being told by Congress. And, and I will reiterate what I said. Most of the time, the collaboration is really good and most of the time we get results right away and most of the inspectors right on the job site will say, do you realize you didn't put that insulating kit in the right way? They'll stop the crew right on the spot and fix the problem, still write the NOPV, which again, shame on us if we make a mistake, we deserve to be fine. Most of them do that, but, but not always. And when it, when it doesn't happen, it, creates, it can create problems. So it's, it's an anomaly. You know, I, 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 wanted to bring some, I wanted to bring some real world examples to the conversation so it wasn't just me opining on what was going on. I wanted to bring some examples. Most of the time, we get relatively quick results. Great, thank you. We are out of time. We have webcasters who are needed to catch a flight here fairly quickly, and we only really have the room till three. Um, I, I had my last presentation here where I was going to explain how we really can get to zero in the next two months, but 
we're out of time, so I'm, I'm afraid I can't, can't go into that right now. Um, um, I just wanted to thank everybody for attending. You will be getting a, 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 a survey from us e via email where we want information on a variety of things. Like I mentioned, we are going to be having a board meeting here tomorrow, and we're going to be talking about the future of the conference, and it'll be everything about nibbling around the edges, whether we should serve Ritz crackers with Velveeta instead of, you know, bacon-wrapped, boiled and butter shrimp um, to save some money. Or, uh, you know, meet at the Hilton in Kansas City instead of New Orleans or something. But, uh, um, but we are really interested in what all the different stakeholder groups think about the conference and how, how it should move forward and changes that might make it more, uh, the, that could make it better for all of us. Um, so thank you again, and uh, we hope to see you next year. <laughs>